Well, good morning, Rockfish Church. I see some faces I don't recognize. My name is Patrick. I'm one of the communicators here at Rockfish, and we're doing service a little differently. I don't have my notes. <laughs> I'm going kind of off script, but there is this, uh, well, this series that we're going over, Supernatural. We're in our second week of that, and with this message, I'm tasked with helping make better understanding of what we do not see, the unseen. And it's kind of a big topic, right? <laughs> Everything you don't see is, is, is what we're going to be talking about today. And honestly, Everything that we, that we did, praying for those that are hurting, and the songs that we sang, most of the message is, is done. So, my job is done. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> no, no. There's, there's a lot to understanding what we don't see, and I didn't want to stand here and, and be like, the dry ice guy, be Ben Stein saying Bueller, Bueller, and trying to teach a lecture, you know? Because of this topic being more engaging than that, I think we need to be a little more engaging. So, to start things off, if you don't know, I'm going to tell you, we are at war. We're at war, and it's not a war that we can fight with w w weapons that we may know, right? We can't fight this war with a physical sword. We can't fight this war with a gun or our fists. We have to fight this war with what we've done this morning, and that's prayer. This war has to be dealt with, not on our feet, but on our knees, right? And here's the thing with this, guys. Prayer is typically something that when we're at the end of our rope, we come to and we're asking for help. That's not what prayer is for. We read in... in the, in the story of, um, and names escape me. I wish I had my notes. <laughs> Habakkuk. We read in the story of Habakkuk that the Israelites are in exile. D -d -d Jerusalem is, a, is in a really bad way. And Habakkuk hears of what's happened to Jerusalem. And the first thing he does is weep. The next thing he does, before even talking to the king, which that's a whole ordeal in and of itself, he prays. And over and over and over again in the story of Habakkuk, we see things are happening around him. And the first thing he does is he prays. He goes to prayer as his first response for everything. Why don't we do that? Have you ever wondered or asked yourself, why don't I pray first? And if you haven't, I hope that question starts tugging at your mind more. Why don't we pray first? We have access to the one who created everything we know and see and experience. And we can talk to him directly. Why don't we talk to him more often? Another aspect of this war that I, I, I want us to understand is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. 
where Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The moment, guys, that we say a, a specific person's name as who we're struggling against, we're missing it. We do not war with flesh and blood. The war that we are fighting is not one that we can see, and it's not one that we in our own power can do anything about. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a part of one kingdom. If you're not, you are a part of another kingdom, and there's those are the only two options. You are either a part of the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. You are either a child of God or a child of the devil, and there is no in-between. You are not your own. Let's understand that. You are not your own. You were either bought and paid for with the price of blood, or you're a tool. And that's kind of heavy, isn't it? In Second Kings, chapter six, Elisha is dealing with this king. And Elisha has this servant that is very, he believes what he can see. And he's serving this God, or he's serving this guy who deals a lot in what he, what he cannot see. Before this time, there was a moment when Elisha was, was dealing with a woman who wanted to have a child but couldn't conceive. And he said, he, he would visit her maybe once every six months, eight months, a year. And one day he said, hey, the next time I see you, you're gonna have a child. And she laughed at him. She said, yeah, right, okay. Enough joking, Elisha, go on your way. And, and they were such good friends that she actually made a room a, and not just a guest room, put a bed somewhere. She built an addition to her house as a room for him when he came through. And she said, yeah, right, whatever. Go on your way, Elisha. I'll see you when you come back. And he came back and she had a son. That night when Elisha was there, her son died. Or rather, he wasn't there. One night, her son died. And she saddled up her donkey and was going to go to Elijah and give him what for, right? Saying, you promised me this kid, and now he's gone, and it's your fault. Her servant talked her out of going and went himself and told Elisha what was going on. He sent his, his staff, his walking stick, back with the servant. And when she saw what her servant had come back with, she said, no, 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 no. That's not good enough. You, you need to come here and make this right. So he does. Now understand, this was not a day trip, guys. Her son was dead for a while by the time Elisha got there. And the word of the Lord came to Elisha and told him, lay on the body.
lay on the kid. Like hand to hand, foot to foot, mouth to mouth, lay on him. He did. And the kid sneezed. And it says he got up. I'd imagine he got up like, <laughs> what? And God said, do it again. Uh-uh, I'm not doing that again. Nope. But he did. And the kid rose. From the perspective of Elisha's servant, it doesn't say that Elisha's servant was there. But I'd imagine, knowing that story, Elisha's servant knows the kind of person that he is serving. And he's still one that I need to see it to believe it. And Elisha knows this. Fast forward to this chapter 6 passage. And Elisha's dealing with this king who brings all of his friends over because he's going to beat down Elisha. And we get here in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He, Elisha, says, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Open his eyes so he may see. This, this servant only believes in what he can see. And so Elisha says, Okay, Lord, show him what I see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Amen. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, this is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. There are th things happening, <clears throat> things happening in our lives, guys, that we cannot see. And a constant question is asked, and I think... Clay has done an am amazing job teaching us to rebuttal that question of why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to people who do good things? And the real question is, who is good? No one is. So then the question then evolves into why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen? And I want to do a little bit of that today. I, I want to kind of answer that question. I need two volunteers. Anybody? Anderson? Anderson? <laughs> Not everybody at once, guys. I need one more volunteer. John, okay. Please give them a hand, guys. <laughs> Come up here with me. I need you on this side, John. You on this side. Okay. Let me grab one more thing. This is not heresy, but... For the purposes of this, I am God. Okay? I have just got done creating everything. And I give 
the keys of everything that I created to Adam. Hi, Adam. <laughs> everything I've done, I've given over to Adam. I made him in, in my image and everything is well and good. But there's another guy. John, I love you. <laughs> but you're the devil. <laughs> and the devil wants to take the keys away from Adam. But he can't because who's holding the keys? Adam, mm -hmm. right? So the devil contrives a way and tempts Adam into saying, look, if you just give me the keys, I'll make sure everything is okay. No donuts. <laughs> <laughs> and the bad thing is Adam does. Adam gives the keys. Give the keys over, Adam. And from Adam all the way to Jesus, this guy has the keys. The one who should not have them, right? He's calling all the shots. He's opening all the doors and closing all the doors. He's, he's making all the choices. This is not how things are supposed to be. And no matter how hard Adam tries, and no matter how hard I tell Adam, you need to get these keys back. Try and get the keys back. He's not going to let him. It can't happen. Now, God can take the keys from Adam and be okay, right? But that doesn't mean that God is just. Because Adam made a choice. There's this thing called free will. Adam made a choice. That was his choice. But God wants relationship with Adam. But now that Adam has given these keys away, we can't have relationship because he's not calling all the shots anymore. This guy is. And I kind of don't like this guy. <laughs> so what happens is a man gave over what God had given. A man has to take it back. Right? So Jesus comes in as a man and is able to take the keys from Satan, is able to take the authority back from Satan. But here's the thing. He still has access. He doesn't win the war. He lost the battle. But there's a time that he's still here and still kind of running around the house. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. Please give him a hand. Bad things happen, guys, and that's why. Because we make choices. We make choices that affect us the rest of our life. And, and there's kind of a balancing act here in, in understanding this choice. There's the aspect that we have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And there are things he does to affect us in our life. But we can't blame everything on him. Because he can't be everywhere at once. And honestly, he's not a creator. He's not omniscient. He's not all-knowing, all-powerful. He's a created being. So, when my car doesn't start, that could be some supernatural forces. It could also be, I got a crappy car for 2,000 bucks, and I can't expect much anything else. Right? Sometimes bad things happen in our lives because we, made, we make poor decisions. That's not all on the devil.
but there are things that do happen in our lives that we can be a child of God. We can be doing what we need to do and still horrible things happen. It can be supernatural, but not everything can be. And that's why we have this. In Psalm In Psalm 8, it says, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He has given us his name. That everything we see and touch and taste and experience has to come in alignment with that name. There's two kingdoms, guys, but God is over them both. It's weird to think that God's presence is in hell, but it is until it's cast into the lake of fire. God is over it all. The name of Jesus makes every knee bow. When we talk about the unseen, we have to talk about this aspect of angels and demons. Because there are four things that exist that we know to be true from God's word. Angels are real. Demons are real. Heaven is real. And hell is real. If we say one thing is real... We can't say, if we say God and Jesus is real, we can't say, yeah, but Satan and hell are kind of an allegory and kind of this mystical thing that, that writers use to kind of make their point around what happens outside of, no, it's real, guys. When Jesus talked about a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth, he wasn't talking about an idea. He was talking about a location. And there's four different kinds of angels. And in, in, in this kingdom of light, it's right side up, right? In this kingdom of darkness, it's upside down. There's four different types of angels. There's angels. There's also archangels and seraphim and cherubim. This is kind of where the the dry ice lecture thing comes in, but stay with me, please. <laughs> so, the Greek root for angels means messenger. And whenever angels appear in the Bible, it's typically, they, they show typically as a man. But there's something about them 
that's really weird and strikes fear into our heart. That's why when an angel comes to people in the Bible, they have to typically say, they, they have to preface everything they say with, don't be afraid. It's okay. You might pass out. It's all right. And then there's archangels, which are more like warriors. Michael is one of them. Then you move into seraphim, which are worship leaders in heaven, kind of. They bring, their job is to bring worship to God. And then there's cherubim, which conceal the presence of God. It's what's on top of the Ark of the Covenant, two cherubim with their wings touching. And it's, it's also the type of angel that was put at the entrance of the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve were cast out and had a flaming sword because he's there to conceal, to protect something of God, right? Right side up. Upside down, are there classes of demons? Probably. Not much is said about this. But what is said is that there are things happening in our lives that we do not see. We see this in Daniel chapter 10. Daniel is praying for, for this thing. And it's so important, guys, that he, he does kind of a Jesus in, in the wilderness thing before Jesus was on the scene. He, he goes without eating or drinking for 40 days. Because this thing that he's praying for is so important. And eventually an angel comes to him and says, I am sorry it took me so long to get to you. I was given this message to give to you the moment you started praying. The moment your mouth opened, I was coming to you. But this, this king of Persia was getting in my way and I actually had to call Michael to come help me get, get some stuff done before I could come to you. Now, as evidence of there are things that happen in our lives that we cannot see, is, is a physical man strong and important enough to hold back an angel? I don't think so. Who was this king of Persia? I don't know. I don't know. But that's just more evidence to say that there are things that happen, guys, that we may not understand and we will not see. But we have to understand it, that we can feel what happens. Scripture says, be careful to be careful to entertain s strangers who come to you because you don't know if you're entertaining angels. There's a story, guys, of of a a friend of Pastor Jeff's in the Philippines. He he his ministry is an orphanage. It's to God be the glory orphanage, and he ministers to uh, the Ada people. It's a people group in the Philippines that honestly have been segregated and treated really horrible. It, it was actually thought that the Adas might be the missing link between apes and humans from Filipino scientists. That that depiction kind of shares with you how these people have been treated. And there was a time, the, the stories this guy can tell are, are book of Acts type stuff. But there's one where he was traveling down a road and it was rainy and it was on the side of a mountain and there's one way up and one way down. And he, he slid trying to get around a, a, uh, a person on a motorbike that he didn't see until the last minute and he hit the guardrail and his truck was going over the cliff and he couldn't get out. And all of a sudden, these two guys dressed all in white come and pull him out of the window just in time for his truck to fall 1,200 feet off of a cliff. He had no more truck. 
And he turned around to thank these guys that he, he saw out of the corner of his eye get off a motorcycle and come to help him. He turned around to thank them and they were gone. They were gone. And he could see the other side of the road going down the mountain. He saw no other vehicle. He looked up. There was no vehicle. But these two guys pulled him out. Now what was that? I don't know. I don't know. I can't say. There's aspects of this understanding the unseen that we that we need to grasp, guys, because there are th things happening in our lives that we either can explain or cannot explain, but we know the one who has charge over it all. But that also comes with something that we must do as well. In Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 14, we read, And when they come, when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him, kneeling before him, Jesus, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long must I be with you? It's kind of a harsh response from Jesus, right? How, how long do I have to be with you guys? What, what are you not understanding? See, at this point, Jesus' disciples saw him cast out demons. They saw him do miraculous things. They knew what Jesus was capable of. And Jesus wasn't hiding the idea that they could do the things that he saw him, they saw him doing as well. He didn't hide that idea. That wasn't a new revelatory thing. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to a mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. There's another verse that, that some translations hide, or not hide, but put in the footnotes because they believe it was added after the rest of the manuscript that said this kind of spirit can only be dealt with by prayer and fasting. Which is kind of indicative that the disciples were not doing that. Which is also indicative that Jesus expected his disciples to be praying and fasting regularly. When was the last time you fasted? Have you ever fasted? And I know that there are some dietary th things that people fall into where, where abstaining from food is not something that they can do, but food isn't the only thing you can fast, right? You can fast social media. Those apps on your phone can be deleted. <laughs> you can fast from TV, right? You can fast fast from things. But here's the thing. And Daniel, you can come up. I'm about to wrap up. Here's the thing, guys. When we remove something from our lives that is coming in between us 
in Jesus. We need to fill that empty space that we would be, that we are abstaining from, with Jesus in some way, with Holy Spirit in some way. Because it's like sand. Have you ever tried to dig a hole in extremely dry sand? It's extremely hard. You, you sh 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 shove in your shovel and move it, and all the rest of the sand kind of concaves and fills in that space. When we remove something from our lives and we don't fill it in with something else, it's just going to fill back with the same stuff. And a lot of the times, it's going to be more of the same stuff that we're trying to remove. It is time, guys, that we step up. This, this unseen, understanding the unseen is, is really good for knowledge. But here's the practicality of it. I was reminded in, in preparation for this message of a of a pastor posing this question to his congregation, and I want to pose this question to you. Our homes are places where spirits want to be. And angels won't want to have any part in where other spirits are left to do their thing. So the question is, spiritually, is your home kind of the frat house? You know what I mean by that? Is your home kind of the spiritual party where spirits are left to kind of do their own thing and mess around because I tell you if it is angels will come by and say I want nothing to do with that another way to ask this is your home a place where angels want to poke their head in the window and wonder what's going on they're in the very presence of God do you want angels to wonder what's happening in your home The things we watch, the th things we listen to, the things we let in, the items that we have, guys, it all invites something. What are you inviting in your home? What are you inviting in your ear holes, in your eye holes? What's going on in there? Because the level at which you fill yourself is the best you can give anybody else. So if you're filling yourself up with crap, my uncle used to, used to mess with me when I would make a, make a statement of fact that he wasn't quite sure was, was true. I have brown eyes. And he'd say, let me see your eyes. Yeah, you're full of crap. It's, it's coming through in your eyes, man. What are you filling up in your heart? Because it's going to be the best you can give anybody else. Maybe it's time to stop watching those shows. Maybe it's time to take a break from social media. Maybe it's time to not utilize the internet, internet unless absolutely necessary. Maybe all of these little things, but it all comes down to, guys, it's time to step up in our lives. We need to stop being babies and expecting milk and start eating more wholesome spiritual food. 
If we're walking around and our bellies are full from being gluttonous, our brains are drowning in dopamine because we're doom scrolling on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and whatever else, but we're walking around spiritually starving, there is something wrong. And that spiritual aspect will have physical ramifications, I promise you. We need to step up. We need to do better. Maybe that looks like getting into your Bible consistently. Maybe that looks like actually praying. Maybe that looks like doing more for your community for the name of Jesus rather than showing, er, not rather than, but on top of showing up on Sunday morning. I don't know what it looks like for you specifically to step up, but I, as Clay said this morning, I am tired of doing church. Saying something harsh kind of to this congregation, guys, I don't want to be a country club. I want to go out there and help people who are hurting, who need Jesus. And we have them. And we're not giving them up. Why? Why? We need to step up. If you're not a member of Rockfish Church and you don't have a home church, guys, consider being a member. Consider being a part of something that is bigger than yourself. If you are a member, there should be no excuse for us to say, I'm not doing anything in my community. Guys, Rockfish does so much. If you are a part of another church, be a part. Do something. Because it's not about Rockfish or LSC or Gord Springs or Liberty. It's about the kingdom of light. It's about the kingdom of God. Warring against the kingdom of darkness. That's what this is about. Step up. I'm not going to pray. I'm going to leave it at that. Step up, guys. We need to.